So you grew up in Seattle? Uh-huh. Like the whole life it was in Seattle? Mm-hmm. So you remember Seattle when it was a, a, a sweet, dark place? I have memories of Seattle. I <laughs> um, actually have a lot of memories from Seattle that are legitimately in the 60s, believe it or not. What was that like? Well, how old are you? Um, I'll be 50 in a month and a half. I just turned 50. Yeah. Right. So we're like the same age. So you kind of remember like kind of 68, 69-ish? Yeah. I remember... Um, I remember what the world looked like, and it's sort of based on on what people wore, what kind of glasses they had, right, and and what cars were there. Hair length too. Yeah, hair length too. The, that, that's true. And yeah, um, you know, everybody kind of looked like CCR, right, sort exactly. of. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember there were a lot of British bikes then. Mm -hmm. So th they were super loud, like way like, louder than anything. What now. triumphs? You like? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. The, the, That was kind of the thing. Mm -hmm. And so in my neighborhood, I remember at that at that age, I moved when I was three and a half. So I still have memories up to then that I know are three and a half or earlier. Were um, you compelled? Because when I, I remember being like from a very young age, looking at the hippies, going like, "That's that's what I need to. That needs to be the direction I need to go." I I think that um, it, at some age. Uh, I kind of went the other way, and it was based on actually knowing some of those guys and not liking them at all. Oh, really? When when you were a kid? Yeah, when I was a kid, I had uh, like the I had a neighbor. Yeah. Um, who uh, <laughs> the bad you know, neighbor? It, there, it, it was a, an, a Filipino man who mm -hmm. was married, mm -hmm. and uh, at some point his wife left, and he had they had had two sons. Yeah. And one of the sons was kind of cool, and the other one was younger, and he was like super hippie-ish. Right. And. He he would he had all his friends kind of coming over and they would sort of live in the basement kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And they all looked they looked like Leonard Skinner exactly. Right. And um, <laughs> I remember a guy. I was walking by the basement and he opened the window that looks up from the basement. and He was shooting something at me out of a syringe one time. Really? Yeah. And I was and and I just thought these guys are creeps. Yeah. And they, they you know, they weren't super mean, but they but they were, but they were somehow. Did they play? Mean. Did they have a band? No, they didn't have a band. They just look like that. Yeah, they Clearly, just look like Leonard Skinner. There were yeah. syringes involved. No, these were guys that were in in and out of jail all the time and stuff. And yeah, they they creeped me out. Did but do you remember uh, the music being part of? Because I remember sort of the Vietnam War, and I remember mm -hmm. I remember Mad Magazine. And I just remember that the hippies like seemed to have the the culture by the balls. Yeah, I don't know. I I'm I'm not sure if I had much perspective of that. Well, we were um, like, how old were we like? Five, or yeah, six. six. Well, yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I do remember like some some of those Seattle summers where, um, you know, there were there were a lot of girls with huge long hair and wearing halter tops, right. and, and like dancing to seventies music, and and all the brothers look like bikers, and that was also one of the things that defines that period is it was the end of the baby boom. So, right uh, in the neighborhood I lived in, every house had five boys in it you know everyone had several big brothers in various states of like college or jail or military or whatever and so like i heard iron butterfly and uriah heap and you know every kind of somebody's big brother's right. records you didn't have a big brother i had two so you got all that yeah i my my big brothers the probably the what got me into Prague was my oldest brother because he he took a turn into uh Kind of like ELP, yes, sort of anything that was, seemed a little weird. You Rough know? turn, yeah. <laughs> and um, but did you can you don't consider your music prog? No, not really. But no. you were into it. Yeah, for for a couple of years. Yeah, I went. In, uh, I, I don't know why I could never do it. I think for me it was a like. I smoked pot at a really young age, and then after a couple of years, I stopped. And, yeah. And I think that that, I think it opened the door to that, just right. the sort of fantasy world of, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. elves yeah. and uh -huh. Tolkien's living in there somewhere. And, yeah. um, uh, and I loved it. And, of course, it was the perfect setup for punk rock. Right. Because just by the time punk rock hit, and I heard it and understood it, the timing couldn't have been better, because it was like, thank God. God, oh, they, this snap, is awesome. Yeah, snap me out of it. I'm, yeah. I'm awake now. Yeah. Thank you for waking me from my trance. This is fantastic. Who were your other bands when you were a kid? Well, Beatles. the Beatles was the band when I was a kid, and it was... Um, Forever, right? I was, I don't know how old, eight or something. My neighbor, one of my neighbors, he had like f four older brothers, and the oldest one had been kicked out of the house, 
and he just left all his records in the basement. Right. And so I stole his Beatles records, and he had everything. All of them. Every reissue, every um, every compilation, every uh, every album. Yeah. You know, and and the the first run of every album, and I had right, all right. of them. Yeah. But they were wrecked. Like all the sleeves were ruined, water damaged, and. I just grabbed them on a whim, and um, you know, I had one of those old student stereos that packs up like a suitcase. Yeah, and I just sat in my bedroom and started listening to them. And the, the by then they had broken up, and it wasn't uh, the Beatles had nothing to do with pop culture, really. right? Uh, they were just these the the mythic presence over everything. Yeah, yeah, the and Beatles. It, yeah, you you would see like like the. The Let It Be pictures were were ev in everyone's house, right? You know? So they were there. It was almost like other family members. This is my oh, mom, you mean like my oh dad. wait the white album pictures or the white album the eight pictures, by tens, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then the cover of Let It Be was four right, photos, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that would be you know that's the big difference between uh, vinyl LPs and anything else is that these albums, if it was a huge album, it was in everyone's living room and you saw it when Took you went up space. inside. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everyone had that Let It Be album in their living room and with the Beatles looking at you. Yeah, so right away you could go like, yeah, yeah. Have Beatles. So, um, Which records were the ones where you were like, I gotta hear that again? Well, I remember really getting into um, uh, Sgt. Pepper's, of course. I really got into the White Album. I really got into Abbey Road with headphones. and and For that, that run on Side B? I don't know what it was about it, but the uh, it didn't do it for me listening to it on speakers, but I discovered that, that there's such a thing as headphones that sound good. Maybe that was the beginning of like good-sounding headphones. Yeah, yeah. And I remember cranking it super loud, and, and I couldn't believe the production of Abbey Road. Like, well, there's that whole incredible. there's that whole run through like you know you never giving me your money, right. Polythene Pam, and then mm -hmm. like that whole like they're all connected, which and is that, Prague, really. Yeah, it is. I but I think it was for them just to like, well, how are we going to put all this shit together? We got a bunch of fragments. Yeah, the well, when when they came out with that um with with that album of number ones and then demos yeah i kind of learned by then like oh that's how those songs came about because they had all these cool little bits <laughs> right, and then yeah they <laughs> couldn't make songs out of them right me and mr mustard made a just a shitty song right but, but part but of this weird thing part of the weird thing it was awesome <laughs> yeah because you're sitting there thinking what were these guys thinking when they did this? How high were they? they how high do you have to be to come up with Mr. Mustard and Polythene Pam? I love it. Really high. Yeah, really high. I love that lick on Polythene Pam, though. I love that guitar on that thing. Yeah, it's great. When did you start, uh, you know, like, what, what, you, what were your folks doing? Were you a, pro a problem? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> but not, not, I didn't get arrested. What kind of business were they in? Um, my dad was a pharmacist. And my mom was a housewife that then got into kind of uh, this sort of white trash interior decorator thing just to get out of the house, sure. to get away from us. Yeah, they go. They either go travel agent, real yeah. estate agent, interior decorator. Yeah, yeah. She, that, that, I was six when she found the need to get out, <laughs> and um, so I was I was the uh, the youngest boy, and I think by the time I was born and, and hit that age, I benefited from the fact that my parents were were over it you know? right so yeah, i could yeah. do pretty much whatever i wanted as long as police didn't right bring me home and that's so that's what i did but music was a big part of it so i was either outdoorsy or i was sitting in a room alone because i didn't i didn't have friends where we would sit and listen to records and talk about it yeah they my friends didn't get it so i just did it alone and it became so how, a lonely thing how, what's the age difference between you and your brothers uh one's three and a half years older one's five years older. oh so not that much not much no are they both still around yeah they're music guys yeah, my brother Peter is. Uh, he actually just finished a solo record. I think that's coming out soon. Um, he he's one of the first guys I remember where. And and this is a funny story because it's like twelve at night, and my dad, who was a pharmacist, is already in his pajamas in bed trying to sleep. And I'm in the basement, and we had this old. We lived in an old farmhouse. And yeah. My brother shows up at the basement door with some older looking dude. <laughs> and they bring in this, the, like, two half stacks of a Marshall, and they put a head on it, yeah. right? And they plug it in. This yeah. is, like, a, almost midnight. Yeah. And and the first thing the guy does, he's trying to sell it to my brother. And, he, and the first thing he does is he goes, check this out. And he turns the reverb all the way up, turns both volumes all the way up, lifts the head off the cabinet, and then lets go. And it crashes down on the cabinet and just goes... <laughs> And my dad comes down the stairs, and I don't even think his feet were really touching the ground. He was, like, almost flying yeah. with anger and hatred, and yeah. his head was like this giant tomato. 
screaming and his teeth were kind of green, yeah. you know, and he was gnashing his teeth at my brother. And, and, and I was looking at my brother thinking, you're out of your goddamn mind. You're lucky he didn't beat the shit out of you. And I was thinking, that's so fucking cool. Well, what, what, what kind of selling? How is that a way to sell an amp by dropping the head? Was it a tube amp or was it solid? Well, he dropped it on the cabinet. And oh, I okay. Think the, Just a little bit. Not it, like it felt to me like the guy had no idea how to play guitar and the, the most he'd come up with what to do with this thing was right. to make the reverb explode. He'd probably just know? stolen it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> and then I remember the next day, my brother going to some rehearsal. Yeah. Uh, with the amp, did he buy with it? With the amp. He bought it, I think, or borrowed it. And it, the 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 cabinets were like on casters. And we live in Seattle, and Seattle yeah. has hills. Yeah. So the last, my last image of this whole thing was my brother s trying to manage to roll this amp and cabinet down an extremely steep hill in the middle of the street without losing control of it and then <laughs> disappearing into the sunset. When did you start playing yourself? I mean, when did you start you know, knowing that that was the thing? Man? Well, I learned some chords. Uh, like, Did you, you know, play before you sang? Yeah. I, obviously. I didn't. I kind of had a, I had a sort of nimble choir boy voice as a, like, like prepubescent kid. Yeah. And, and, uh, and could sing really well. And then when my voice changed, I, like whatever range I had disappeared completely and I, I gave up on singing. I didn't think. No, you found it again. again. Yeah. It took some, <laughs> I, Soundgarden really helped me find it. <laughs> we, we couldn't come up with a singer and I was like, oh, I'll try. Really? Yeah, that's how it happened, really. I was the drummer at first. It's so effortless, man. I mean, when I saw you at the forum, I was like, you didn't even, like, you weren't, there was no theatrics to the, uh, to the, uh, the amazing, uh, that what sounds like should require strain. Yeah, I think See, if you, if you do, if you're doing it right, then, then it, sh it, it shouldn't, shouldn't require too much strain. Well, if, you, it, if you're going to try to sing a two hour set, yeah, th there's techniques they teach you. All of the straining and the pushing and the stretching yeah. doesn't help make that sound. I think it's just your instinct to like, oh, how do I do this? Well, it's a breath thing, right? Yeah. Once uh, you have it. Yeah, it's sort of like it, you just got this little reed in your throat hanging right. out, and all the muscles in your neck and everything surrounding it don't really help it by like, right. by like trying to strangle it. But that's sort of what I did. Um, but I learned how to sing really in Soundgarden rehearsals because we were really loud, super loud. And in order to get my voice to cut, I just started pushing it really hard. Well, so where, how, how does it start? What's going on? And are you going out to see live shows in high school? I mean, what's going on there? What were some of the shows? Not you much. Were I mean, I, I, I think I probably saw like you know sort of bands at the dance and and like skating rink sort of stuff. But we were like we're the same age, so the touring rock bands were who they were. I mean, I remember. I fucking. Do you remember when Van Halen's first album came out? Yeah, and I, I remember, was like, "Holy shit!" I remember the first time I heard Eruption, and I didn't understand that it was a guitar. Right? Yeah, and everybody was playing. It was like everywhere. Yeah, Eruption yeah it was, was everywhere. everywhere. Uh, I remember a kid walking across the the <laughs> playground with a boombox, but you know, before there were stereo. Right. And and uh, like a Panasonic thing. Yeah, like a Panasonic yeah. with a. You know, it sounded pretty good. Yeah, but, yeah. And it had FM on it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, um. And I'm hearing it and thinking, my God, what is that? It's like changed the world. Yeah, it did. <laughs> but that, but it also did another thing, yeah. which punk rock cured. It, it sort of, like, I never thought of myself as being in a rock band or being, um, you know, I didn't have dreams of being a rock star ever. What were your dreams? Um, I didn't have any. You just wanted to no, I hang was, out? I was just sort of, uh, I was a wild kid. Yeah. And, and, uh, what, just like running around, driving around, smoking weed, drinking? Climbing trees, swimming, yeah. running around in parks. It's fucking beautiful up there. Yeah, it's, Seattle's a great place to grow up. At yeah. least it was then. And and, uh, and then l listening to music. Right. And uh, but So I, I could play, like I learned how to, some chords on acoustic guitar. I learned to read music and play piano when I was like 10, but then I quit because it was like school to me. Right. And I didn't, no one encouraged me to keep keep it up. I regretted it really soon after that. Um, of course, I regret it now, but um, it's hard to focus. So, man, if you like, you know, I've yeah. been playing a long time, and I'm not even a real musician. I'm just a hobbyist. But you know, there are guys who are nerd out and they'll noodle and they'll figure mm -hmm. all that shit out, and then there are guys who just want to get out what they want to get out. Well, I don't know that. I I don't think that I had uh, an. I probably had the personality to sit in a room and noodle, yeah. but probably not the raw talent to pick up a guitar and go, I can do this. I never had that thought of I can do this. 
uh, until I was literally doing it. And well, and drums kind of did that for me. Well, what was you? What were you saying about the the way that punk, you know, was the the sort of the well, key, when you the hear cure of uh, when you of hear, the, and I'm not putting down Van Halen. I think that they had elements of that same, like just simple, straightforward rock that right. was in punk rock as right. well. Right. Um. But Eddie Van Halen's a musical genius. Right. And, and I think I think there was a period in commercial rock music where. It, it kind of came from Led Zeppelin and, and, and that period where commercial rock became, you know, a, a, a singer with a five octave range and a guitar player that that has two necks on his guitar and can play both of them somehow kind of at the same time, you know, and, yeah. and his his biggest influence isn't another guitar player. It's actually like Bach or something. Right. That you know? That's what they say publicly. Yeah. And, yeah. and I didn't think I didn't. First of all, I didn't think Seattle produced people like that i thought you had to like be born and grow up somewhere else england they, yeah. they, they only make those in england <laughs> exactly something <laughs> like you and you, i don't know and you couldn't be blue collar i didn't understand the blue collar part of rock because i think that confused it too and so punk rock uh it changed everything you know for me in that in anyone that, could do it i could yeah i could be in a band i was in a band within like three days of the first time i ever played the drums i was a drummer in a band <laughs> and the funny thing was that at that age i was probably 16 having had no aspirations to do or be anything once that week was up i knew what i was going to do for the rest of my whole life and that good? never and it never went back. It was that good. Which yeah, it was great. I had no the, there was like there's nothing 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 rock band. I guess that's what I'm doing. Great. And and uh when I by the time I was 24 or 5, that's when a lot of my friends were were you know, we'd be hanging out getting drunk and they would say, you know, I just don't know what I want to do with my life. And and it occurred to me then how lucky I was that I never had that moment. I, w I was figuring I'll mow lawns and wash dishes until I'm 100 years old, but I'll, this is what I will do. Did you mow lawns and wash dishes? Absolutely. Really? Yeah, I did all those things. Well, I broke concrete. I cleaned fish guts. I did. And, and it was all Pikes, fine. At Pike's Market or No, elsewhere? I worked at a place called Ray's Boathouse, which was sort of a, a, like a, a seafood joint on the bay beautiful so you can take view. a part of fish to this day yeah they, someone presented you with a fish no i worked problem. at a couple seafood wholesalers where it, where it was just really more of the the cleaning up fish scales and slime um and i ended up you know just kind of doing the i ended up then after that doing jobs you can do when you're in a band but you but you want to go play shows for a couple weeks and so that would either be like construction restaurant stuff stuff like that but i like i was never unhappy because while I was at work, whether it was a cook or washing dishes or something, I was thinking about my band and music and s arranging songs. And well, what was the band you were drumming in? How wh what were they playing? What were they called? Um, the first band was uh, called J the Jones Street Band because my house was on Jones Street, and my oldest brother had turned our garage into this soundproof, windowless <laughs> rock environment. <laughs> a rock environment. Yeah, he didn't. Right. He had a stereo that was absurd. Right. Um, that that was like 300 watt thing um, that was so loud that the neighbors would complain when I was listening to records, but they wouldn't complain when the band was playing because the stereo was, was louder. It was louder. Yeah. So he moved out and I inherited his pad. His rock his environment. His Greg Brady kind of pad. Yeah. And and within a, you know, a month of having it is when I bought a drum set. and, and Your neighbor. parents must have been very fairly supportive. Well, my parents, were, my parents were divorced. At that oh. time, my mom, I think my mom was thrilled that I was doing something that didn't include alcohol or drugs or... Yet. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> she had no foresight, apparently. None, because I, <laughs> being in a band is where the heavy drinking really started. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um but so, that we we did that, you know, and and the that Jones led, Street Band, the Jones Street Band. You're led, playing drums. I'm playing drums. Who's playing guitar? Um, there were two kids in the neighborhood. Uh, one was 15, one was 17, and one was like student of Hendrix, right? 15 year old, and one was student of Jimmy Page, uh, the 17 year old. And to this day, and unless my memory's not serving me right, those guys were. Awesome, right? They were fantastic. Hey, in that moment, they were probably amazing. They were really, but you know, they were playing like the 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 
Zeppelin guy would he would he could play the solos from Days of Confused like different bootleg live versions oh, over right. and over, and you right. could listen and and a b them. He was doing it, yeah, in earnest. So he's those are real nerds. He was good, yeah, and you know they were both good, but but it, really quickly. You know, it's it's like 1977, 78. Um, I was getting into other stuff. I was getting into punk music. I was getting into this other stuff. And none of those kids really seemed to be into it. They were holding on to the uh, the old paradigm. One out of the one guy that I started the band with was into it. And he was one of the first guys that actually he played me a song from the farts which was a S- Seattle band um, that ha- Duff McKagan was in it and, uh-huh. and some other Seattle notables. And uh, I think the song was 18 seconds long or something. Yeah. And and it, there, it was had the most energy I'd ever heard in something that you might dare call music. And we would listen to it over and over and over. And so I shifted gears and then I was in like, all, like several I don't know, seven bands over the next couple of years. Well, well Hendrix, like the, the whole idea of Hendrix hangs pretty heavy over Seattle. Right, because I mean that's where he came from. Yeah, there were a lot of um, there were a lot of Hendrixy guitar players, and there were a lot of bands where they just did Hendrix songs. And there was um, was it Randy Hansen who he was a he made a living out of being sort of a Hendrix tribute guy. What? So were you guys doing covers like with the with the first band that? Oh yeah, like, yeah, anything we could think of. Now, when you started broke into punk after you heard the fart song and the 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 the, the sky opened for you. Yeah, and, and I think it quickly went into kind of a post-punk indie world of, of I like I I was a fan of punk for about five minutes, and then I discovered that oh, punk isn't just like fast bar chords and spitting. You right, know, there's more going on musically and artistically. Really, who were the guys that, um, that showed you that? Um, where that where that kind of come into it? Friends that lived sort of near colleges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But do you friends remember the lived, bands? The friends that lived. Um, I'm trying to think. There was a band called Wire. That mm-hmm. was the. F- I think that was the- Wire or Killing Joke were the first couple bands where I understood that their their punk could also include musicality, um, other stuff. Because Wire, I would hear Pink Floyd in it. Right. And I was a huge Pink Floyd kid. Yeah. Um. You know, music was escapism to me. So right. I thought I, that made sense. And uh, so it didn't have to just be political, social commentary with, with blistering power chords. It could be trippy and it could be, there could be social commentary, but it's more esoteric. Right. And Killing Joke was like this, the, is he Robert Smith? Singing in a heavy metal band? What is this? I didn't get it, but I, I got that I liked it. Hard to place them. Yeah, and, yeah. And that th- those two bands really, I think, were instrumental in me understanding that it, that there was a, there was some sort of future right. that music was going to have, and no one was going to know what it was. So, so after you learned that stuff, where where are, where are you at? Do you still living at home? Um, I mean, no, I moved out pretty young, so I was you know working in restaurants and and just had roommates. And and you, know? you and you were playing drums. I was playing drums, and I had roommates that had cool records. And are they musicians? Um, no, not really. Not the, not the no. They're guys set. that d- you know, drunken jams. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> you're all and, you're you're all sitting around smelling like fish. Yeah, drinking beers. But these are guys who were there. These are people I knew who were who were around me when I got my first drum set, and I wasn't a musician either. So there was you know there's some something they must have observed I wasn't paying attention to. Um, but still, those are your friends that they're a part of who you become as a musician and a lot yeah, of levels, absolutely. you know, coming home with the, uh, the first REM EP and going, what is this? Why is this good? I don't know, but it is, right? Yeah, it is. You know, you got to get, get consensus. <laughs> are, we, are, exactly. are we on the same page here? Yes. I don't want to be a dick. And it's like, know? no, I think it's good. <laughs> I really do, and and um, you can't trust your own instincts. Like I, you don't even want to say I love this. You're just sort of like, yeah. what? And we okay? Even okay. though I did love it, right? Like I exactly. wore that thing out, and and so uh, the I bounced around in in different bands. But one, of, I had a roommate that had like a nervous breakdown, and that's really the beginning of Soundgarden because the I had met Kim and Hero both from Soundgarden while we were sort of messing around in this other one of the many horrible bands that I was in. Which one was that? Um, it was called the Shemps. Yeah, the and Shemps. It was awful. Yeah, and and the guy who was it was his band. He he knew both of them. And Kim I, and yeah, Kim and Hero, and I yeah. met him somehow. So he was. I was introduced to those guys, and I called Hero one day because I owed him money, and he had a uh, he had a, his roommate 
got mad at him and was leaving. Right. And he said, you know anyone who needs a roommate? And I said, yeah, I, I do. I need to move in somewhere now. And I moved in like the next day. And he was, it turns out he was a bass player and I was a drummer. And so we started, we s- decided we would start a band and then we waited. We couldn't find anyone that Who we wanted to play with. Who's that guy? Hiro Yamamoto. Right, right, right. And so we he couldn't was... find anyone until it, one day he said, you know, maybe, maybe Kim should come over and we'll, and, and see what happens. And that was, that, that was this revelation when Kim walked in. The three of us, we wrote like seven songs in two days yeah. kind of thing. And Kim was playing guitar then? Kim like, was playing guitar, and, and it was unlike anything I'd ever heard. I'd never heard anyone play guitar like that. I still haven't. Mm-mm. Really? <laughs> and it was natural, you know, it wasn't, yeah. it didn't seem like this guy, because I ran into a lot of burnout guys that were, that were desperately trying to invent something that was unique. And, we sort of wanted we wanted to invent our own band but but we didn't we didn't seem to have to like try try to sort of intellectually do it it right. just happened you know it's like wow this is different and then you're excited about it and then that makes you kind of trust what you're doing and steer into more different and feel like well any way that I want to express this yeah. is valid so kim always had that thing like he you know he had a way of playing that was organic to him no matter what yeah, and it's, it's a rare thing. And it meant something to me, like if like if he plays if he plays some guitar thing that he showed me back then in 1984, that I haven't heard since then. It gives me that same feeling, like if I hear an old Beatles song, it did it triggered something in me that I didn't uh, ever hear before, and that and I connected with some on some emotional level, I guess I don't know. So you guys were fast friends. Yeah, right away we we. Uh, we wrote an incredible amount of songs. Any of those songs end up on the first uh, Soundgarden records? No. They're, did you play them? Yeah. Like, we we seemed to click in a way, sort of alone in a room, that translated to our first sh- live show ever, seamlessly. Like, the first live show, we had to talk somebody into giving it to us, and um, we went in, we were a three-piece, and, and I sang most of the songs from the drums, and it just went over. And And there was... And you were called Soundgarden. Yeah, and there were, I don't know, 40 people maybe. Who came up with that name? Um, Kim. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Is it, it's, I, I just realized it for some reason. It, it always represented something a little harder to me, but it's sort of a sweet name. Well, it, <laughs> I don't know why I didn't it served it. us really well because it, I think that the, having that name was part of us becoming kind of a big draw in Seattle especially. And, and even when we far, first started doing tours, anytime we were opening up for a band, and what would happen is... We would open up for a band that was kind of heavy and and sort of angry. like who, like I don't know. I mean, I can't remember like what a good example of that local would be. guys. But like, say we played a show with Husker Du one time, great. And so, if you didn't know who Soundgarden was, and you would see it, you would think we were some sort of green on red, kind of a like a, a neo psychedelic right. alternative REMI thing, right? Right, right. And then you would show up, and we would open, and we would come out and be Soundgarden, and then they would go, "Holy fuck." <laughs> And so people would love us yeah, because yeah. of that. I, I think the the guys in oh, the so the, trees had that 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 experience with us. They didn't. They came. They actually came to our show to laugh at us. And then we came out because of the this, name. Because of the name Soundgarden, I guess. They yeah. Thought, well, the, who are these hippies? Yeah. But right. I got that a lot. It's like, wow. Well, I, th- I thought you guys were going to be this <laughs> psychedelic thing. And and then they would like us sort of more than they otherwise would have because they would have been pleasantly surprised, you know. And. Uh, it ended up being a really good thing. So you were three piece, and okay, so you open for bands like Husker Du, and they're monsters, man. They're like uh, balls to the wall. Yeah, and they were my, I think they were my favorite band at the time, and we were a three piece, and they were a three piece kind of thing. Okay, so who else is around? I mean, because now we're coming on to something I'm sure you've talked about a lot. I mean, some scene is developing there. Um, correct. Well, I, I think the closest contemporary at that time um, was then Green River. I was at their first show, and it was Steve Turner and Mark Arm from Mud Honey and Jeff Ament from uh, Pearl Jam. From Pearl Jam, and then that's a good band. I had that yeah. record. I don't have it anymore. I like that record though. And then they ended up, and then Stone Gossard ended up joining that band as well, and it kind of had different. It, it had different incarnations. Now, were you guys mostly friends? Because I, I mean, I watched that. Um... Yeah, we were. The, the, it was a very small scene. That 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 sort of urban punk scene was very small like you the audience was always the other bands really and you would still call it punk no i'm not sure what we called it because like it's weird how like whatever this the idea of of grunge or whatever it, it always seemed to me to be you know pretty pretty much rock 
Yeah, but it didn't. <laughs> but it definitely came from a U.S. indie scene, which, right? And what what the to define what that was at the time yeah. was Husker Du, Bad Brains, Sonic Youth, the Meat Puppets, the Meat the, Puppets, uh, Butthole Surfers, yeah, and um, like just take those examples and put them together. None of them sounded anything like each other, and everybody seemed to have completely their own trip. But it had roots in was in, in arena rock in punk, was, right? And in in what then was starting to be called alternative, simply because it was an alternative to commercial rock. Mm -hmm. And you know, when that word first came up, it was still a word that had a definition that is in the dictionary. And then it became a genre where where it wasn't. It, it used to just include anything as long as it wasn't commercial rock. And so, you know, you could have a sax player in your band, like the Seattle band Feast. You know, they had two singers, and one was a boy, one was a girl. And when the girl sang, the boy played this kind of, this sort of free jazz sax. Over right. It. And it, was, it wasn't like anything. Well, that was that time, like, also because out of punk, you also got that whole world of art rock that was cool. Yeah. You know, like pure This pure is what that kind of was. Right. It, Perubu was like one one of our sort of god bands that right. you would pray to, and and um, Sonic Youth, and that that kind of there that, was room for it. There it was, was room for it, it, and it was it it seemed like this open chapter of a book where it, it could go on and on and on, and you can do anything you want, and there are no boundaries, and there are, and Soundgarden benefited from that thinking, um, and probably what defined us then, and what what made people talk about us was that we were sort of including anything we wanted and some of that was not okay at the time like what and it was not okay is it on the records it was not okay to the to to the fans of indie music for example then and that was kind of a unapologetic maleness yeah that was in incorporating sort of heavy riff rock that right. reminded people of bands that were at the time considered to be you know Sell out completely commercial. uncool, right? Uncool. Not so much sell out, sell, sell out commercial, but like if you, for example, if someone said somehow that last song you guys played reminded me a little bit of Led Zeppelin. For most bands, that was a bad thing. For most bands, that was the kiss of death. But for Soundgarden, it it, it seemed <laughs> people kind of started to look at it differently. Like, and and that was the first time I heard like this phrase of Zeppelin in a good way yeah. because there was at that moment nowadays Zeppelin is always in a good way but in in those days there was a whole lot of Zeppelin in a bad way because you had bands like doesn't um, that seem White crazy Snake. yeah it kind of does although if you think about it what was taken from Zeppelin by all the commercial rock bands yeah. was was the hair the like super tight pants. Um, the fashion kimonos right light show mm -hmm. it's in an arena mm -hmm. drum solos going on stuff like that they didn't take the the sheer rawness of i mean every every led zeppelin song to me on record especially the earlier records sounded like they had written it right while they were playing it almost like <laughs> yeah. jimmy page didn't seem to care like he would do these blistering solos where he would miss like five or six notes would sort of fret out and his fingers would miss him. He didn't give a shit. But also, like it seemed to me at that time, because we're the same age, you watched all those bands sort of arc out. Like you know, the best of those bands was what mm -hmm. you're talking about now. And by In Through the Outdoor, which is still a good record, it's a, yeah, it's, but it, I still love it. Yeah, but it was a huge commercial success, and, and people had lost touch with what made those bands so fucking good to begin right. with. Right, and and where you know you you're either rejecting them. I mean, I think I think. By the time Song Remains the Same came out, punk music was already blowing up in, in London and in New York. And it was know, in that, earnest. And it had to be a reaction against everything. Right. And and so um fast forward to like nineteen eighty five, eighty six, we're sort of allowing some of that into our music and, Did it and happen it's naturally, getting a violent reaction. Re one it, way or the other. Well, there were a lot of supporters and I think that, that I think that that's where we found kind of a new not only our own voice but we were doing something pretty much nobody was doing well you must have been surrounded by you know arty sort of like you, you, you know nerdy kids yeah there was a poet guy who yeah. seemed to weigh you know less than 100 pounds right you know and there was um there there were college djs that were supporters yeah a lot of guys in other bands there were writers that was it was Basically, college people. But I, I, I imagine at some point you just started seeing dudes you like to rock show up. Not for a while. Really? Yeah, really. It, <laughs> really? It, yeah, that didn't. That happened. Um, that happened later. 
That I think you're pretty much in the '90s before that happened. Really? Yeah. Because like, in, in even now, like even when people compare you guys to Sabbath or can compare Kim to you know to that type of uh, heavy riff laying, I mean, at that time Sabbath was even they no one gave a shit about Sabbath either. No, but I think what it is is that the the guys still listening to Zeppelin and Sabbath records would have no way of knowing a band like Soundgarden existed at the time. Right, right, that's they right. They didn't go to any re- indie record stores or listen to college radio or buy indie records. Um, they still were in their kind of in their cave. And it was so it wasn't until um, Alice in Chains came on the scene and, and they were actually the first band to... to Break? Th- yeah, in a sense, because they they didn't have an indie career. They didn't have a they didn't have an indie background. They they were kind of a suburban metal band that then was suddenly sort of influenced by all the bands around them in Seattle. And their first record deal was was a major label record. Um, but they had all these new, new elements that they were kind of pulling into what they did. And they were the first band to sell, the, like, they had a gold record, you know. Um, and they were local guys. And they were local guys. And you guys, guys. knew them? Um, by then, yeah. I, they weren't part of the early scene, but by, by the time their first record came out, we all knew them, yeah. So, wait. We were friends. So what was, the early scene was, like, the guys from Pearl Jam, the guys from Mud Honey, the guys from... Um, Melvin's we'd, we played with. Um, but, like, in town. In town. Were the Vaseline's up there? Yeah, the but I don't remember even seeing them. But they were there. Um, the what what sort of predated that scene? The the huge bands were the Blackouts, um, which be, most of them became um, part of Ministry at some point. Yeah, and uh, there's a band called the U Men, um, and that that was sort of the that was sort of the scene that we walked into. Right, we were playing shows at the same time as them. Um, but then what we did was. And what Green River did seemed to kind of create a, a, a maelstrom of of new bands that started to include like people from like guys from Alice in Chains, like that they could see that and go, we can we can make records like this. We can, some yeah, of that. we can fit into yeah. this in a way. There's right. a, there's something new for us too. Did you and feel then, like they were riding your your scene? Was there those kind of weird competitive? moments of like what are these guys doing not there? really i don't i don't really feel uh, i felt like if there if there was a band that was outwardly the most influenced by us it was them for yeah, sure yeah um but i also felt like i always felt like there was nobody like soundgarden because there really wasn't right you know? and if you listen to our albums and compare them to any other band the, there was nothing like that and and i still think it's the same way i still see like we play we play Festival shows, we've done like three or four with Arcade Fire, and we can also go play right before Black Sabbath, and either one's fine. And well, you, well, you've defined your your thing. Mm-hmm. You're, I mean, you guys are a thing. You're not a, an opening band, or a, uh, you're you're a band. Well, I mean, stylistically, we our music can fit with with either or. And, yeah, and I think that that's unusual. So what what was the the sort of moment where I mean I know I mean I watched uh, Cameron Crowe's documentary, and he seems to kind of put a lot of the center of the scene on Mother Love Bone and Andrew Wood mm-hmm. and as as being this defining moment of of the transition of that scene into the mainstream. Do you see that? Um I think Soundgarden's first show where like guys from A and R guys from major labels came, that yeah. was that was the defining moment. That really. was it. Yeah, because the Were you guys the first guys then, with a deal outside? We were the first guys that had any uh any interest from like co- like a commercial label ever uh-huh. by a lot uh-huh. well before uh, Love Bone or Alice in Chains. I don't know. If, I don't even think Alice in Chains was a band then. And what happened was through just a, a couple of circumstances, there was a woman that that was the program director at the college radio station. She made a compilation tape with Seattle bands on it. We were one of them. One song. Which um, song? I think it was called Nothing to Say that ended up on the first sub pop record. Mm-hmm. And and then Mike Borden from Faith No More, the drummer, was a huge fan of Soundgarden. I guess we played a show with him. Yeah. And he got the the uh, the woman that signed Faith No More to Slash Warner, he got her interested. So uh A M Records based on on uh this tape from the radio station and and uh Slash Warner, which then became she then be, became an A and R person for Geffen, 
they came to one show, which was at this kind of cross dressers, uh, sort of goth bar that, that had shows. And yeah. there were very few places to play. And that was one of the good ones. And we, we knew that these A&R people were coming and it just had never happened. And it wasn't something that anyone thought about. Right. Um, and they showed up and I don't remember who opened, but we, we just blew it up. Yeah. We did it. It was the right, it was the right <laughs> moment. Somehow, whatever was supposed to happen, happened. Yeah. And, and then we were like in a major label bidding war the next day. And we basically said no to everyone. And we didn't, I think it was two years from that day that we ever even signed a deal because we felt like we're an indie band that knows who our audience is. They know who we are. You guys are going to destroy us. It'll be the end of us. So, so this you know, was the enemy. Yeah, kind of. But the, the, the enemy looked around while they were there. They saw us and, and I, I don't remember who it was that opened for us. It might have been Feast or something. And, uh, they realized there's something there. You're right. Something so, happening. So right away, once, once the news was that there's this Seattle band called Soundgarden that's in a bidding war, um, A&R people kind of, you know, just like flies just jumped on Seattle. And Love Bone was a band that was kind of a, um, you know, like a fun band th that came out of, um, Green River, where it was just friends doing something that they thought was kind of fun, and then they just decided we're going to do this. And I think they, and then they were the second band after Soundgarden to get that kind of um, that kind of love. And they had great, you know, they had great songs. They were the band. I think that Mother Love Bone was that was the band that could have actually saved commercial rock in the form that we had known it up to then, right? Because they were the only band that was a bridge between. Um, what was happening in commercial rock and, and what commercial rock became, really. Because they had elements of, of all of it and it all made sense in, in the context of really great songs yeah. that you would remember and that would get played on the radio. And uh, the fact that Andy died, I think, ac was actually kind of the nail in the coffin in my mind because I know that they would have been a huge band and I know that somehow that, that what they did would have would have allowed some of these other bands to kind of transform a little bit and continue to have a life but because that didn't happen um, it didn't work out that way it was suddenly you know anything that was commercial rock was easily recognizable and and immediately the enemy but they had a, they had the bridge with Andrew. They had a bridge with with Andrew and the way that they presented and themselves, the way that they the the way that they could incorporate influences from a band like Aerosmith, even a ballad version of Aerosmith, right? But still have uh, this all of this indie pedigree and 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 all of these other influences. They seem to me in earnest to be able to to marry those two sides without it being weird. It and was, and you were tight with Andrew. Yeah, we were roommates for a long and time. And did he when he died? Were you roommates? No, we hadn't been for a year, I think. What what role? Like because like I know like I you know my first wife or my second wife uh, was from uh, was from Seattle. Mm -hmm. Now where did all this fucking heroin come from? Because it just seemed to like just consume that city, man. Yeah, but uh, you know, based on what really? Uh, and and I can say this, you know, from exp experiences like post alcohol addiction yeah. and drug addiction where I'm where I'm trying to be sober yeah. and well, say I will go to an AA meeting right I'm the only musician there and and if if there's another musician it's like one other guy who's who's maybe 10 years No I know yeah it happens to anybody yeah. yeah and and that was my thought and feeling of of it was that it's it, it's not like the whole music scene was addicted to heroin. It was like, to, you know, a couple guys. No, I just mean the city. There are certain heroin cities. Maybe Seattle was one. Yeah. I, I didn't really get that feeling. Yeah. I got the feeling that there was there was a group, you know, of, right, of, of guys dudes. Right. <laughs> there were the heroin guys. <laughs> yeah. And that, Team heroin. <laughs> and that somehow, you know, Coke wasn't popular anymore, and, and heroin sort of was. And, and, um, that was just and also, you know, uh, untimely death is one way of, of sort of, creating that feeling right you know and there were a lot of dudes in that scene that were were into that but yeah i didn't i didn't feel like i felt like it was less than san francisco or new york right it's different i think it was different dope i don't know like i i'm sober like almost 15 years and mm -hmm. i you know i remember 
there was definitely this this cutoff uh-huh. between like the booze and coke guys, yeah, and the weed guys, and the heroin guys were like, all right, that they're they're a graduate level, yeah. And I, I didn't I didn't know any of the heroin or coke. I, if I knew them, yeah, you know, we didn't we didn't hang out. I, I, I hang out with the guys that you know were. We were active guys that drank beer, so we would ride mountain bikes at night, and we would put a forty ouncer where the water bottle is supposed to go on the bike, and and that was the, that was the extent of it, really. Sure, heroin was not an out in the world drug. <laughs> no, it wasn't to have fun and <laughs> climb trees at four in the morning and <laughs> no. swim across the bay. Yeah, no, coke was a panic drug. Heroin was a I'm just going to hang out drug. Yeah. Alcohol, you could get shit done on alcohol. Yeah, you could still somewhat, you know, we had a normal life for at least through our twenties. We were still doing everything we did. In our teens right so well that's uh that's what mu- being a musician entitles you to all right so you turn your back on a and m initially and yeah. you record what how many records we did we, well we put out a sub an ep on sub pop to a couple eps on sub pop i remember um, those and then uh and and then kind of our dream comes true really and and this sort of was oddly timed because right after we released uh, our first EP was the second re- Sub Pop release ever. And Sub Pop essentially came together because of Kim's relationship with the two partners telling them they should work together to start a label. And uh, th- when it's time to do another thing, um, SST had called Bruce Pavitt at Sub Pop and was yeah. interested in Soundgarden. And, and Sub Pop didn't have money to give us to make a, another record at that moment. Yeah. And so Bruce actually said, you, you should go make a record with SST. And... To me, that was that was our dream come true Valhalla moment because that was the label we wanted to make records on the that, whole time. And there was this period where we were Soundgarden, we had probably two albums with the material, and we were thinking, "Well, no indie is going to ever." But that's a really indie label, like the Minutemen, Dinosaur Junior. Yeah. who else is on there? With it? The Meat Puppets. Meat Puppets uh, yeah, they did one, at least one record with with everyone. So right. I think Husker Du might have done a record on SS. They did do they records did, on yeah. SST. Yeah, Sonic Youth did at least one. Bad Brains. Um, so now you're being coronated. Yes, this is where this is where we want it to be, mm-hmm. and and so we had this opportunity. And by then we made that we made that album. By then, um, th- that was really pissing off A uh, and M and Geffen and stuff because they're still talking to us and trying to convince us to sign. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And guys? those record deals, like I can tell you now, um, the 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 first the. The sub pop record deal was one piece of paper, one piece. Um, the SST record contract was maybe three, right? And I think we hired a lawyer to look at that one, and we—he seemed more confused by it than us. So we didn't even, you know, <laughs> yeah. we we met with him in my living room for ten minutes, and yeah. then that was it. Yeah, and uh, and those both turned out to be good deals for us, right? Um, and and they were for one record. Now you're talking, you have these guys coming to your shows and talking to you about uh, five records with an option for two more. And I'm thinking how long it takes to make a record. So I'm thinking, so when I'm 30 something, you know, maybe we'll have fulfilled the contract. Right. And then someone will tell you, well, maybe it depends on if they pick up the option. Then you've got another four releases. And, 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 uh, they're talking about, you know, you're, you're essentially making a contractual obligation to, Except a record budget for a record that you're going to make eight years from the time that you sign the deal, which makes no sense monetarily based on on any monetary system that's ever existed. Right? They just own you. That's all. It yeah. Is. And and uh, so they're they're talking to us like that, and we're feeling like, why? Why? Yeah. And and so once once we made once we started making the SST record, the songs that these labels wanted to sign us. Four, based on these songs, essentially, they start feeling, well, now they're using up all their songs on these stupid, uh, frivolous indie records. That right. was the way they spoke about it. Right. And that was the moment where we, we just had to have this this sense of, we had to have a sense of ourselves and self-confidence and be like, you know what? We just got started. Yeah. We're going to write more songs. And uh, what followed that, I think, was uh, s- some demoing for A&M where they just weren't, you know, they said, we'll pay for you guys to go in the studio and just record some new stuff and let us hear it. And we, I don't know how many songs we recorded, but we did like a rough mix of a couple and sent it to the A&R guy who 10 minutes after he listened to it was 
had like tripled the offers of whatever it was they were going to give us. And so at some point we thought we're going to have to transition because we want to, we want to reach as many people as we can. And there clearly is a limit to what indie labels can do. Um, and we still had that concern about, about a major label connecting to our fans that already existed. And to this day, the SST album has outsold the first A&M album. Louder than love? Yes. Because really? they, they, f- they helped us kind of find a new audience that was a commercial rock audience ready for something new. Right. But we lost some of the indie audience because they literally would only buy from mom and pop stores that wouldn't carry an album from right. A&M and wouldn't carry the magazine that A&M uh, advertises in and, and wouldn't watch a video program that might play your video and right. you know, none of that stuff. So we were, we were right to wait and we c- probably could have waited a little longer. But what that did was, uh, what what Louder Than Love did on A and M was, it started to chip away at what commercial rock was. The the song Get on the Snake, which isn't even in four four, uh, and doesn't have a chorus, was the first song I heard being played on commercial rock radio in L A. at drive time. Yeah, and I'm in a car, and up until then I it didn't make sense to me. But then I heard it on the radio in between Tom Petty and something else. Yeah, and I thought. This works. This actually, it, it sounds like it should be coming out of the speakers between these songs. Um, that's and a big moment. That's, that was a huge moment. <laughs> yeah. And it didn't lead to a hit record, but it did lead to uh, MTV, radio, uh, anything that was sort of the, you know, the gatekeepers of commercial rock were changing their perspective. They were coming to us. We weren't going to them. Is Loud Love on Louder Than Love? Yes. That's a great song. Thank you. I love that one. So that changed the whole paradigm. That, that was started, the beginning yes, of that, yeah. that changed the and and it wasn't you know it was very quick and the the, the other bands doing that right then were uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Jane's Addiction really and Nirvana wasn't there yet no they they weren't around yet so this all leads up to Super Unknown which is huge but mm-hmm. but what Bad Motor Finger went platinum right Bad Motor Finger went platinum uh, I think it actually went double platinum double platinum that Louder was, Than Love did not Louder Than Love did not Louder Than Love was. W- Louder Than Love was magic because the buzz on our band and the album and what was happening uh, was so much bigger than what we had sold. I remember when we got offers to open up for Guns N' Roses in the U.S. and Europe, um, we were all kind of scratching our heads. And and I think it was our lawyer at the time that said, well, he, what's happening is that everyone thinks your record sold a lot more than it did yeah. because everyone's talking about it. And they don't know. So just pretend that it sold as much and go do it. And, you know, it's one of those weird things. Um, but that, that led to, uh, that led to Bad Motor Finger, which, which then, you know, by, by any standards, double platinum is, is a huge success. But during the, that year that it became, you know, that it sold two million records, I think Pearl Jam probably sold 16 and Nirvana sold 15 or something. You right. Know? So, which was a, which was a mixed blessing. And on the one side, you could go, how come it's not us? On the other side, we didn't have a backlash and no one was mad at us. Right. You know? so we, you kept, we were still okay. Get some cred. Yeah. All right. So then you do Super Unknown, which is like huge. Five, what? Quadruple? Well, I think we did plan. five million in the U.S. and three million but outside. That's like such a huge record. Yeah. That's, such a that great, is mammoth. It's a really. great fucking record. And I've been yeah. buying your records and I was listening to your records. And then when I heard you guys were breaking up, like I was one of those people. I'm like, why? What? How does that happen? Well, and, and that's the thing. Like, and, and that's what's. Maybe it's the timing. I don't know. In terms of what was magic about Super Unknown is that we had been a band since 1984. Now it's 1994, but people only just heard of us last year. You know, people in terms of the of the big picture of outside of this little indie world. Right. It's like we're a new thing. It's the new thing. Have you heard that new band? Yeah. No, they're coming out with a new record. And for us, it was like. We were we were reinventing ourselves as songwriters as right. in the studio. Everything about right. it, we were. Um, You're growing different ways. Yeah, and and just in a natural way. We didn't wake up one morning and go, "Oh my God, we got to really, we've got to do something different here." It was the opposite. It, we were just. It was time. You know, we were pushing the boundaries of what we did, and that album came out. You know, at that time that we were reinventing ourselves, people were just discovering us, and that for some reason that w- seemed to work commercially, which is. Still, to me, a strange thing. The, the idea that Black Hole Sun, for example, could be this international hit single. If, if Have you ever read the words to it? 
Yeah. It's amazing to me that, that it well, it's not anthemic. It's extremely dark. It's very esoteric. It's stream of consciousness lyrics that I don't know what they mean. Yeah. Um, and you I don't know it. what Paul Anka thinks it means, but he sings the shit out of it. Yeah. And, I've heard that. I got that album. Yeah. It's a weird album. And so... Uh, I don't know, it, but it worked and, and, and it felt right. And I think, you know, we really killed ourselves to, to make that album and to get to a new place as a band that could live on. But touring for that album also brought us into a point of crisis that I, that I saw Nirvana go through and I saw Pearl Jam go through it. Um, and that is that we came from this post punk indie world with the punk rock Bible firmly in hand. And uh, we killed commercial rock music by then. It's gone, done. Sunset Strip the, is they're wearing flannel shirts and, yeah. and have pink hair. It's over. And uh, we did it. And and but at the same time, um, now we're playing hockey arenas, and we're in the same magazines that that scene that we killed was in. And suddenly we're having this existential crisis of we are that. And, right. and I think Soundgarden's, Soundgarden's way of dealing, we internalized it, and, and I think it was part of an implosion. Now, when we made Down on the Upside that, that followed it, I, it's one of our, our best creative moments, and we produced it and mixed it, and, and uh, it was great. But we'd been a band for a really long time by then, and we were, you know, Super Unknown was just this strange shift in finding an audience and and also kind of a, a band a decade old going through this this reinvention but you, did you guys fight no it just was the natural progression of things you I needed so. to do some other shit well we had when did you get one sober? thing about being an indie band is yeah. that is that you're in a van driving yourself you don't have roadies and you're you're basically scouring the earth. You're playing right. everywhere. Yeah. If there any little town that has a place that you can play, you do it. Yeah. And um, so, so by the, being a band for ten years, and then s suddenly, you know, you're having this great commercial success. That's usually when a band goes out and and does what Metallica was doing the whole time, which is you support a big record like Super Unknown for two years. Right. We weren't having it. Yeah. We were we were tired. <laughs> we were done. You know, we didn't want to go scour the earth on tour so we didn't even if you were on a jet no we didn't care we we didn't we didn't have it were in you, us was that when you were you worn out is that when you got sober um no i didn't i hadn't even really got going yet oh really <laughs> yeah i think that there was a period in super unknown where that kind of started to pick up steam you know in, in terms of drinking but it wasn't until after soundgarden broke up that i really i think i had a meltdown yeah what'd that look like not good. And <laughs> I, I don't know how long, a few years. Yeah. Yeah. It, you really, you drink yourself into like just complete fucking insanity or just. Yeah. Sadness? That's a great way to describe it. You yeah. Know, I don't think you know that it's insanity at the time, but yeah. the biggest lesson I learned from that and which, you know, leads to my biggest warning always is that you live in your brain. So if you're mixing chemicals and, and you're constantly under the influence of that, reality is going to look the way it is, and that will be what reality is. Sure. Um, but it's it's valid for that situation. You change the situation, at some point the reality will change, your outlook will change, your perspective That's will true. change, your ability to deal with it's it. It's an inside job, as they say. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. and I don't know, I think that... Uh, I think that some people have that in them and you know for me I, I think it was always there I was the responsible guy I was the guy that always had a job yeah. never needed money um, worked really hard never got fired um, made you know I always made sure that that the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted sure. you know even as a rock musician I was pretty reliable and control freakish maybe a little bit yeah but learning how to deal with that right. and and um it, I think f for me, whatever it was, that that ability to go so far out with with um, alcohol, it was just a situation that was kind of waiting for me. Right, you need and to then, break it all apart. Yeah, when yeah. I reached a point where where I was like super emotionally vulnerable, I dealt with it in the way that that people like me deal with it. I it, I retreated from the reality of it instead of being a responsible guy and trying to figure. My life out and make hard decisions and deal with it. And you were still writing music. I mean, some of the oh, solo absolutely, albums, I never stopped. Yeah. But the solo records must have been part of that dialogue. Yeah, and I think that that 
you know, the difference between drinking, not drinking would have just been, I would have made two instead of one in the, in the year and a half that I did. You right. Know, it just slowed me down. Right. Um, I wasn't someone that wrote, I couldn't write anything, um, drunk. So I would have to wait till I wasn't and right. then write. And then right. when I felt like I had something good, I'd be relieved and celebrate by getting hammered. Right. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but it, 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 uh, it it was just like kind of laying in wait and yeah. wa- and waiting for for me to be weak and then I dealt with it in the way you know a uh, uh, a person that's acting weak does and then until I was fed up with it and now you're okay now I'm fine I you think. seem good good <laughs> <laughs> so well you did all that you did this stuff with Audio Sway you did the so- solo records and now this we're we're talking because it's the 20th anniversary of Super Unknown yes and I, I'm 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 anticipating my vinyl thank you and you're going to tour with the guys yes. Yeah, well, we start touring soon. We're actually going to Europe. First, we're doing an event in New York where we play Super Unknown from top to bottom again. Oh, really? Yeah, and then we're going, and then we're going to go do a bunch of uh, shows with with Sabbath in uh, in Europe. And this is Sabbath's kind of big moment right now, and we get to be a part of it, so it's great. That's uh, that's it. Seems like uh, perfect. Yeah, it's great. How does Kim feel about that? Everyone's psyched about it, really. And, and uh, you know, we've we played shows with them before, and um, like if you if you sit and talk to them, it's not you know you see, suddenly you see there's a lot of parallels between the two bands uh-huh. in ways that you never would have thought. Right. And suddenly now that we're the age we are, the 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 age gap it shrinks. Yeah. You know when right. you're when, when you're, you're twenty yeah. and someone's thirty. Yeah. It's you're on two different planets, right? But when you're fifty and someone's sixty, you're the same, sure. And yeah. you've been through it, exactly. And, and you know, those and, guys, and it doesn't the, the opinions about about generations and music right. don't mean anything anymore. It's well, like, yeah, and also like uh, y- you know, you're survivors. You're all survivors. Yeah, exactly. And the band's getting along good. Mm-hmm. It's fucking, great. It's amazing, man. I'm talking about Sabbath, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'd heard stories that yeah. you and Kim were not well and uh, for a period, and but you're that, good. He, that's actually not. That was never true. Oh, good. None of it. Did you hear that? Um, or well, am I making I've, that up? I've seen it written. Okay. No, no, no. I've seen it written, and and basically, what the stuff that I've seen written was something that could have come out of like the text, sort of written about any rock band, right? And that that always happened with with Soundgarden. You know, we were this band where. Matt might be the guy that writes the heaviest song on the record, and he's the drummer. Yeah, and and Ben from the from the moment that he joined the band was was, was contributing, you know, almost more music than anybody else for a minute. And so you've got this band where uh, everyone in it is multi instrumental, everyone in it contributes music, and yet. Um, the the way that we would be sort of written about often was like the classic rock kind of Jimmy Page, Robert Plant, um, Pete Towns and Roger Daltrey sort of the guitar player is the musical genius and the singer comes up with words and so wears, just, wears uh, tight uh, pants yeah. and they hate each other. And, and that was stuff that I saw written and it had absolutely nothing to do with n- not even similar to our inner band dynamic or how we functioned as Soundgarden or how we created what we did none of it interesting so they just needed to understand why why this band went through this so they're just like let's just use the old model it must be because those two guys yeah and yeah. and say it in a, confidently in a way that people read it and go yeah well I, I bet you that's it but no we we had a meeting I think two weeks after we split up where we were just discussing like different business stuff we had to deal with given that we were, were going to be defunct right and I remember everyone seeming relieved and in a good mood, and and we got along great. And and I remember thinking, well, that's great. This must be the right thing. And when we got back together, and you know, for the first time, I think it was late two thousand nine, where we're talking about yeah. doing stuff. Um, there was five minutes where it was weird. Yeah. Only because we hadn't all been in the same room together. Not because the, and I think maybe when, you know, you're not with each other, everyone has this defense mechanism that builds a sort of paranoid view of how everyone else must be thinking. Right. And after that five minutes, we realized that didn't exist and, and it, we've been great ever since. You know, we've, uh, there hasn't been one moment that, that isn't positive since we got back together then. And that was, that's already now going on four years. So that's uh, it's awesome, man. It's great to hear, Chris. Thanks for talking to me. All right, thank you. 